Hi everyone, thanks for coming to the Physics and Applied Physics student hosted colloquium. I'm looking forward to an interesting hour. I remember the first time I heard Michael give a talk. His work was unique and innovative and very thoughtful in the way that it addressed very complicated natural systems. It was one of the most compelling talks I had seen in the field. I met Michael when he was a postdoc here at Stanford with Daniel Fisher and can report that in addition to an excellent theorist and engaging speaker, he's a kind and valuable friend with a great sense of humor. Please help me welcome Michael Fikanov. Can you hear me? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Um, thanks, Alana, for that introduction. <laughs> uh, like she mentioned, I was here uh, a year ago, so it's great to be back. Uh, it is a great honor to be back as a student invited speaker. Uh, so it really is a pleasure and having a great day. So to my student host, thank you. I will start with a bold statement. Microbial ecology is revolutionizing biology. Now, revolutionizing is a strong word and very heavily overused. Wherever you look, something is always revolutionizing something else. But I'm consciously using this strong word because the more we learn about microbes, the more we realize that the very fabric of how we think about biology, the very words we use, are beginning to fail us. The picture we have of ecology and evolution is shaped by our macroscopic intuition. So if I look at a cat, it seems very natural that I can draw a bubble around a cat such that what's inside is the organism, what's outside is the environment, right? And the difference is that what's inside is the time scale of physiology and evolution. What's outside is the time scale of environmental change or ecology. And this is, it is this separation that allows me to talk about fitness as the fitness of organism in its environment, right? And then organisms in some bubbles are interacting with organisms in other bubbles. But these are all implicit assumptions. And so I might wonder, when I think about microbes, how much of this perspective is left? And it turns out that not very much. So the very basic words that we use, such as organisms or species, are becoming problematic. So let me tell you an anecdote. Uh, it's the story of Methanobacillus emiliansky. So there was a, a microbiologist, Vasily Emiliansky, who wanted to isolate a bacterium that could metabolize ethanol. So he actually fed rabbits with liquor uh, and tried to isolate bacteria from its uh, poop. And eventually he succeeded. He found an organism. And in 1936, it was named after him. It was called Methanobacillus emiliansky, and so it was official, it existed, it had a Latin name. And then, it, fast forward 30 years, it was happily growing in labs all over the world, when it was discovered that actually it's not an organism at all. It is actually a consortium between a bacterium and an archaeon, which are as far from each other on an evolutionary you know, tree as we are from E. coli. It doesn't get more similar, more different than that. And that was kind of, you know, people got excited about this because, aha, uh -huh, it's actually two organisms and not one. What I find fascinating about this story is that for 30 years, we couldn't, we didn't notice, right? We couldn't tell them apart. And so we can debate whether we should call this two organisms or one, but maybe it's just the wrong question in some level. You don't actually have to go to microbes to see things like that. So, uh, there's, been, there's a lot of fascinating work on ants, for example, where people were uh, fascinated by these creatures. Um, in particular, uh, now that I'm at WashU, I'm proud to call uh, David Queller and John Strassman my colleagues. So ants, there's a formal sense in which people argue that maybe you should consider the entire ant hill an organism, and not the individual ant, because it's only the queen that can reproduce, and so in some you know, very formal sense, it's the ant hill. Um, that is the unit. So for leafcutter ants, it's actually even cooler because the way uh, they make a living is they make the, they cut these, uh, these leaves, but they can't, they don't eat them. They can't. What they do instead is agriculture. So they cultivate this fungus in their colony and they feed the fungus with the leaves 
they groom it from bacteria. They actually have uh, microbial symbionts that secrete antimicrobials to help with that. Right? And the fungus isn't found anywhere else than in the colony of ants. The ants can't eat anything but that fungus. And when the queen goes off to found another colony, it actually has an anatomical pouch where it collects the spores of this fungus and carries it along as it founds a new colony. Right? And people were really excited about these kind of examples because it's so weird and so different. But for all we know, in the microbial world, this could be the rule rather than the exception. So that's for the organism. For species, it's even worse. Um, so first of all, they're just fundamentally ill-defined for microbes. You know, some classic definition, group of interbreeding organisms with fertile offspring, that doesn't work because uh, microbes reproduce asexually. Moreover, they can exchange DNA with each other. So this whole picture of tree of life, it's all a lie. It's not a tree, right? Because if these guys can exchange DNA with that guy, there's no more, it's not a tree anymore. And we see this in the data, right? There's, it's not just philosophy. There's fascinating work by uh, Edith Cassell, Eric Van Nimwegen, among others. And there's a very influential uh, paper that showed that if you take 60 genomes, all labeled E. coli in different data sets, they only share 20% of their genes. And if you take any two E. coli, they can differ in over half of their genome. Now that is clearly a problem, right? There's a massive literature. I didn't have enough space to put all the et al's in here. Uh, and this is only a kind of small subset. Um, this is not E. coli. This is example from Acinetobacter baumannii. Uh, this is a matrix where every row is a different genome, where it's yellow, it's when a particular gene is present rather than absent. And you can see, so these genes are called core genes, they're shared, but there are lots of genes that are found in some but not others. And again, every, any two rows here can be different over half of their gene. Okay. So with all that, what is left of this picture? Well, first of all, ecology and evolutionary timescales are not separable. So we have a problem with these bubbles. And if we have a problem with the bubble, then it's not clear what we mean by fitness and what environment, if environment always changes. Further, like I told you, it's not even clear what to assign fitness to. Right? So one big question that we should ask, of course, is should we care? Because the picture of species and organisms, it is obviously useful. It even is, you know, seems silly to put that on the slide. Right? Biology made tremendous progress using these words, and they are an excellent approximation in most practical circumstances. Right? So maybe it's kind of theoretically a little uncomfortable, but maybe it's not an issue in practice. And perhaps that's true. What I want to point out is that kind of the history of theoretical physics shows us the value of following up on inconsistencies like that when it's an internal inconsistency in the theory or between theory and data, right? So at some point, somebody noticed that Maxwell's equations are not invariant under Galileo transformations. The speed of light come out of the constant. That's kind of a little weird. Or the black body radiation. So this wasn't really a problem for computing you know, circuits. It wasn't a practical issue. Black body radiation naively kind of seems to diverge, but surely we don't think that the universe is about to die thermal death. Right? So again, it's not a practical problem, but it's by following up on these things that one might argue is the only way to discover something like general relativity or quantum mechanics, because these are very unintuitive theories. But if you think about it, well, of course they're unintuitive. Our intuition developed on our scale, and it has no business being valid for objects at the scale of atoms or for objects at the scale of parsecs. And so I think it's really exciting to kind of wonder if maybe microbial ecology belongs in, this, belongs in this list, because the same is true for microbes. Microbes are not at our scale. OK, so this is why, hence the title of my slide, uh, of my uh, presentation. But now the question is, well, how do you make progress with something like that? Right? Um, I want to clarify something. I don't think debates on definitions are interesting. Right? I have no interest in trying to settle the question of, you know, in this example of Methanobacillus meliansky, if we should call this one organism or two. I think that's the wrong question. But inspired by this, uh, one might ask a different question. Can I have a theoretical framework that smoothly interpolates between an organism and an ecosystem? That is a different question. In fact, 
Uh, if anything, it's even more dramatic at the scale of big organisms because as we now know, a cat is not actually a cat. It is also an ecosystem. It's filled with microbes. And without those microbes, it's not very fit. Right? Okay, so can we smoothly interpolate between an organism and an ecosystem in some theoretical framework? So with the current theory, we can't. Because with the current theory, We've, when I'm looking at a system, I first need to decide if it is an organism, in which case I should be talking about evolution, or if it's an ecosystem, in which case I should be talking about ecology. And these are two separate sets of theories in important ways. So for example, you know, evolution is about replicators that seek to optimize their fitness, right? Ecosystems do nothing like that. So there's an important distinction there. And if we are to make ever progress, any progress on even asking this kind of question, it seems important to find a way to link them in some kind of theoretical framework with the same mathematics. So this is how I'll structure my talk. Mirroring this separation, I will tell you two stories, entirely independent stories. One will be in ecology, and I'll say, here's a fun question in ecology, and we'll talk about ecology. And then we'll change gears completely, forget all about ecology, and say, here's a fun question about evolution. And then we'll talk for a bit about evolution. And hopefully I'll show you that there are lots of interesting things we can ask along the way. But the two stories will be separate until, kind of surprisingly, I'll show you at the end that the two stories I'll tell you about, about are actually based on the same mathematics. And then I'll loop back to the beginning and try to kind of say how this maybe outlines a path to asking the big questions that I started from. Okay, so that's the plan. So, here's a fun question in ecology. One striking feature of microbial ecosystems is how diverse they are. And so one might wonder, is there anything special about ecology that happens in the limit of large n, where n is, uh, for example, the number of species, this is an old uh, field. Mostly it's been kind of historically investigated in this context of Lotka Volterra like models, where we have species and they interact and these are the equations. I'll talk about a different uh, kind of theories where instead of talking about species one, two, three, I want to have a more functional description. So I will describe, I want to know what a species does. Okay? So I'll define species by what resources it consumes. And this has an added benefit that um, one other thing that's different about microbes is that unlike foxes and rabbits, uh, microbes often don't eat each other, they actually eat molecules. Right? And maybe that's also makes something different. So these kind of models are called consumer resource models. Uh, and let me first define them for you. So this is, you know, classic ecological models dating back uh, to the late 60s. In fact, it's the simplest possible model you could write down that's about this feedback loop between organisms and food. So let's say I have n sources of food. I'll label it by i. And the availability of food, I'll denote hi. And now I have competing species. And the species are defined by two uh, pieces of knowledge. One is how much energy they require, right? And the second is, what is the metabolic strategy they employ to try and meet that requirement? And now, the dynamics are the simplest you could imagine. So if there is extra food, species grow. So the growth rate of a species is set by, here's how much food I collect, the sum over all resources, whether I can eat it times how much is available. This is how much I need. If I have any extra, I can grow. So this is this arrow, food determines organisms growth. And as population grows, it depletes the resources. So that's the other arrow. And to define that, I say that there's a total demand for resources. So sum over all species, whether they take up the resource times how much of that species there is. And the food, like the availability of the nutrient is determined by there's some external supply rate minus the demand of all the species. Right? That's a model. So there's a very uh, nice geometric intuition about what happens in this model. So let's think about the space of resources. And if species is defined by a line, 
uh, where this is where there's not enough food for it to grow, this is, there's enough food for it to grow. So if I put it in an environment with this much food, nothing happens. If I put it there, this species can grow, and as it grows, it depletes the resources <laughs> until it gets onto this line. So this is nice because I have an easy geometric way of thinking about competition in such ecosystems. So if I have several species, so here I have two specialists, this one can grow if there's enough of each one, that one can grow if there's enough of each two. Right? The equilibrium of my community is always at the boundary of this gray region, because if I'm inside, then nobody has enough food. If I'm outside, at least somebody can grow. Right? So the equilibrium is always on the boundaries. And so if I keep introducing new species here, a species, for it to be able to invade, it needs to be able to slice off a chunk of this region. Right? And so if I keep joining new species, I might find something like this. Okay, so it's kind of a convenient geometric picture to have about uh, ecology and this kind of mathematics. So the model I described to you, like I said, it's a classic model in ecology. I want to study it in large N regime. Why? Because in natural environments, N, which remembers the number of uh, resources, is at least of order 100. We know that. There are lots of metabolites that are important. But the classic work uh, of Tillman, for example, study this in for n equal 1 and 2. Why? Because Tillman is the person who first introduced this geometric intuition I described to you. Uh, and even if you're Tillman, you can't draw pictures in 100 dimensions. So in large dimensions, instead of drawing those pictures, um, the way to, one way to represent this math could be, uh, I'll use this graphical representation letter later, I have n resources. Their availability determines the growth of species. And species define demand for resources, which in turn sets how much is available. Right? And this, this is just like represent, representing this mathematics. And the way demand determines resources depends on these parameters Ri, which is the external supply of resources, and that defines my environment. Okay. So when I study this in the large limit of large n, there's some curious collective things that start happening. Uh, and uh, for example, in the model, oh yeah, by the way, so this picture is symmetric here because uh, the way I described it to you, the same sigma mu i appears in two places, right? If I pick up a resource, it allows me to grow, but I took it out from the environment. So in this model, this is the same thing. So the way I described it to you, there is, uh, at large n, there's actually, uh, you can find a phase transition. Uh, it's kind of interesting things happen. I don't have the time to tell you about very many details, but let me give you kind of a taste uh, for some of the things that are happening. So for this, let me go back to this uh, intuitive two-dimensional picture. So this line defines a species. So actually, the angle of this line, that, is, that kind of is what the species does. It's its strategy. Whereas how close this line is to the origin, that is how well it does it. That's this requirement in food. Right? I can call it efficiency. How much, with how little food can I survive? So let me ask the following question. How important is efficiency for species success? If you remember this kind of little animation that I showed you, that every time a new species can invade, it needs to slice off a yet another chunk of this gray region. You know, every new line there is closer to the origin, and the distance to the origin is precisely this efficiency. And so you might conclude that efficiency is critical for success of a species. And you'd be correct. And this is kind of nice, because this efficiency is kind of like fitness, right? So you'd be correct to conclude this, but only in low dimension. So one of these interesting things that happens at large n is the following. So if I plot, this is a plot. Um, I didn't give you enough details, but this is to, to give you a taste. So if I plot here the correlation between species survival when I keep generating them and this efficiency, and this is the control parameter, which in this game is the number of species in units of number of resources. S over n, in one of these phases, it's actually become strictly zero. It's not important at all. How is this even possible? You can actually understand this geometrically. So imagine that I have a community of some species that all have the same efficiency. And I ask, is it possible to invade this community if I'm a species with worse efficiency than that? 
which geometrically means, can I intersect this gray area without intersecting this red sphere? Right? This is everything that has the same efficiency. And you see that, yes, the answer is, it is possible. There's these little ears sticking out, but they're kind of small. And especially if I have a number, a lot of species, they'll be tiny. There's a very little volume there. But one kind of, one of famous non-intuitive property of high dimensional geometry is that if you increase dimensionality, the vo relative volume of these ears actually explodes, which I represent here like this, right? But in high dimensions, the inscribed sphere in a cube is actually exponentially small in volume. Most of the volume, it becomes in these corners. And so the most probable way of actually invading this community is not by doing something better, but by doing something different. Right? And that's kind of the intuition. So I ran through this kind of quickly, but I just wanted to give you a little taste. So remember, the question was, is there something different? Can there be something different about ecology in this large end limit? And this kind of, um, we can address these kind of questions by studying for these kind of consumer resource models in large end limits find some emergent collective phenomena, relate them to gen uh, generic consequences of high dimensionality. And this is a very exciting interface area between ecology and statistical physics. Uh, there's a lot of techniques available for that. And so there's lots of fun things to do. So that was my ecology story. And now I changed gears completely, like I promised. Forget ecology. Here's a fun question about evolution. Totally different story, totally different science, right? And the question I'll ask is, how does evolution act on performance trade-offs? I should probably pause a little bit, because it's going to be a completely different story now. OK. So performance trade-offs. And performance trade-off is a situation where I have two tasks, and I can be good at both. So for example, I take some organism, I look at the mutants around it, and I might observe that mutations that make me better at A tend to make me worse at B. If I see that, I call it performance trade-off. Now, trade-offs are ubiquitous in ecology. First question of ecology, why are there so many species? First answer, because you can't be good at everything. There are niches, right? There are trade-offs. It is also really important for how we think about evolution, they often are modeled, sometimes they're modeled explicitly, often implicitly. But whenever you have a model in evolution that says, I can have this trait, but then there's a fitness cost, right? That's a trade off. So they are everywhere. But in most models, we simply postulate them. And it's fine as long as we're talking about trade offs enforced by some rigid physical or biochemical constraint. So to give you an example, you know, if I'm a bird and I want to crack a tough nut, I need a big beak. But then this big beak will not fit into a small flower. So I'm sorry, it's like one or the other. Right? So perhaps unsurprisingly, the best characterized examples of trade-offs are in this class because they're easiest to think about. But something we're learning now is that many relevant trade-offs are not in fact rigid. So we repeatedly see that in experiments, in evolution. Perhaps the most striking case uh, is in evolution of multi-drug resistant pathogens. So as an example, let's say I have two antibiotics, A and B, and I put some pathogen and I look at its mutations and I observe this trade-off. And I say, oh, this is fantastic. Because now, if I treat with drug A, if any bug is still around because they evolved resistance to it, they necessarily become sensitive to bug B, and now I treat with B and I win. Right? That's amazing. And we wouldn't have a crisis. But the problem is that evolution finds a way. And so after some pressure from antibiotics, you may find that your cloud becomes this, or maybe even this. And then you have a problem of multidrug resistant pathogen. So we know from data that trade-offs evolve. Trade-offs depend on evolutionary history. And so it's very natural to ask, well, can we have a theory of that? The way in physics, we like, one way we like to think about evolution in physics is uh, in terms of these models that go back to population genetics. So I think of, you know, take a genome, 
it's a, se a sequence of zeros and ones. Let's write fitness like this. There's enormous complexity that you can generate this way. It's very interesting. But you can't really much make much progress on this question in this way because, well, the reason we write this is because that's how Taylor expansion works. Right? And we all love Ising models. But there's no function, there's no biology here. And so when I talk about trade-offs, I talk about different environments, and then I need to specify, well, how do all these coefficients depend on the environment? And then I'm back to square one, because now I need to postulate fitness landscapes. I need to postulate my trade-offs. Okay. So this is a question um, we've been thinking about. This is joint work with your very own Shamit Kachra and Daniel Fisher. It's a world's simplest model. It's just linear algebra in high dimensions. We think that this is a fun model to use as, um, yeah, so, okay, I, I forgot to say. So we have a lot of data, but we don't really have, in theory, we don't even have a null model. And the problem of not having a null model is that we don't know which observations to identify as surprising in the data. Right? So we've been thinking about what kind of null model we could use. So here's one. Think of a genome as a basis. And an environment is some target vector. And I try to fit the target vector with the basis I have. How well I can do that, the, approximate, the quality of the approximation, that's fitness. Except I do that not in dimension 3, like in this cartoon, but in large dimension n. Okay. So what are all these vectors? What's all this fitting? Uh, let's motivate this somehow. So I'll motivate this. Consider an organism that has some traits. Maybe there's you know, body fat composition, length of fur, um, ability to sweat. In a, in a given environment, I have some ideal place where I want to be in this trait space. So let's say I have a cold environment where I want to have this much body fat and some fur, but I don't want to sweat. And then a hot environment, neither fat nor fur, but some amount of sweating. That's where ideally I would be. So if I can regulate independently all these traits, Great, I can always reach the optimum. But let's say I limit my organisms to two hormones. So I might have organism one that has one hormone that co-regulates fat and fur, like this, and then another <coughs> hormone that triggers sweating. So then this organism is fit in the cold environment. It can, I can set the first hormone to about two. That will approximate well where I want to be. Right? I keep the second hormone off. And in the hot environment, I just use the second one. Now let's say I have another organism where the two hormones regulate separately fat and fur, but it cannot sweat. <laughs> so this one, it is also fit in the cold environment. In fact, it's more fit because it can hit this target better. But in the hot environment, it's not very good because it cannot sweat. And then if I have a third environment, for example, you know, I want to swim in cold water. Then I need even more body fat, but I don't want fur because it will slow me down. Right? So then this guy is very fit, again, and this guy can't make it. Right? So this is the kind of intuition, but I don't want to label my columns by specific traits. I want to keep an ab abstract model. So this is the motivation behind the model I described to you. Think of a genome as a matrix for simplicity to zeros and ones. There's n traits and k knobs I can turn, kind of k regulatory patterns of co-regulation. And if I, can f if I can regulate every trait independently, it's easy to be always fit. But think of the regime where, say, n is 100, but k is just 4. Right? I, I only have very few knobs. So if I highlight where the ones are, this is kind of my building blocks, uh, my basis vectors. And a given target, a given environment specifies some target, and I'm trying to fit this target with the basis vectors I have. How well I can do it, that's my fitness, that's the model. So solve the optimization problem, find best expression levels for this approximation, and approximation quality, that's my fitness. One kind of technical comment, I want to stress that the values of a mu, sorry, um, I don't consider them part of the genotype. For me, the genotype is just this matrix. And that is actually important because I could think of evolution as also acting on the expression levels. In which case, it's, uh, it's, called, it's just a funny version of what's called a Fisher geometric model. But I don't want to do that. I want to allow expression coefficients to depend on the environment. And that is precisely what makes it possible for the same genome to be very good in this set of environments, but not those. right? And that's what makes this model 
very nice for studying the kind of questions uh, I uh, formulated on the trade-offs in evolution in multiple environments. Biologists call this phenotypic plasticity, that I can adjust my phenotype to the environment. Okay, so this model that I described to you, there's, it's fun for all sorts of reasons. Uh, for example, you can think about both mutation and recombination. I can change my vectors a little bit, or I can borrow a vector from another organism and ask how useful is it for me. Right? And that's kind of models for horizontal gene transfer in a kind of non-trivial way, all while remaining minimally structured model. So it's kind of really nice. But for my story today, I'm just saying that um, I just want you to take away that this is an interesting rich null model for studying evolving trade-offs because we find that this model does have trade-offs, but trade-offs can evolve, trade-offs depend on evolutionary history, and so those are the features that we see also in the data, and that's why we're excited to try and apply this kind of minimal model to um, some data from uh, the lab. Let me give you a taste of some of the behaviors that this model predicts to show that there's something non-trivial, <laughs> right? So because this model has environments explicitly, if I have a pair of environments, so the simplest thing about trade-off, trade-offs need, trade-offs are across multiple environments. So the simplest case, two environments, okay? Because I model them explicitly, I can ask what happens if I make my environments more similar or more different, and I evolve there. Right? So, I might ask, how hard is it to be fit in both? And you might expect that, you know, it's easy to be fit if it's the same environment, and the more different they are, the harder it is to be good in both. And that is correct. If I just sample random genomes, little random matrices, I will observe, indeed, this trend. But importantly, what evolves is not typical, right? Endpoints of evolutionary trajectories are not random genomes. And it turns out that for evolved genomes, things are quite different. So if the two environments are basically the same environment, then yes, it's easy to adapt. No surprises there. But it turns out that if my environments are very different, it's also easy to adapt. Because if they're very different, they force you to dedicate half your genome to one and half your genome to, to another, and you kind of develop this modular architecture, and then you can improve both separately and independently, you can do that efficiently. And it's the medium, the intermediate regime, that turns out to be hard. That's kind of an interesting non-monotonicity, but it's also fairly intuitive right, that this might happen. And this has some very interesting uh, consequences let me illustrate one thing that this leads to. So the punchline is that when you start thinking about evolution in multiple environments, you may discover that the best adaptation for environment X evolves in some different environment Y. So let me show you this. Let's say I have some pair of environments I really care about. Maybe this is you know, cold season and hot season. And I want to evolve genomes that are very good in these two environments. So how would I do that? One thing I could do, of course, is to evolve genomes in that pair of environments. Meaning I expose it to one and then the other. Right? So this defines this evolution trajectory for me here. Uh, on the uh, y-axis, I plot the mean fitness in the two environments. Mean because there are two of them. Right? And so as evolution proceeds, I'll be getting better fitness. Okay. But as I just described to you, I could also do a different thing. I could take my genomes to say, ooh, yeah. I could take them to California, where it's almost you know, the same weather all the time. Or I could take them to Boston, where I just came from there. It was really cold. And evolve them there. So I could have two other evolution trajectories here. And what I'll be showing is I always evaluate fitness in the environments I care about, but I evolve them in different places. It's kind of like they, we have uh, these experiments in the lab where people evolve bacteria under pressure from one antibiotic, but monitor performance in the other. Right? So this is what I'm doing here. So I'll show you how fitness, uh, the fitness values every 10 generations. So I start from the same value of fitness. I start from the same genomes. So they all have the same value of fitness. And then I evolve them 
uh, in these separate places, monitoring their performance here. So after, 10, after 100 mutation steps, here's what happens. And you see that the genomes that perform best in this environment I care about are actually those that evolved in California. Why? Well, because those aren't exactly the environments I want, but there's no conflict between the selection pressures, so I can evolve efficiently. Not quite in the right direction, but fast. Okay. Let's wait for some more. 250 mutations. This is what happens. So evolution here stalled. What happened there? Well, evolution struggled here in Boston at first in this harsh winter, right? But eventually, these large variations forced my genome into modular, uh, discover this modular solution, at which point it's, it can evolve in leaps and bounds. And then it overtook these guys. And then, of course, eventually, if I wait for a very long time, you know, the best fitness you can get in the, some environment is if you evolve there, ultimately, right? So if I wait for a very long time, I see this. So what does this mean? Well, let's go back to this point here. If there's any migra migration in my system, then these trajectories will actually never reach higher values because these resident uh, organisms will be outcompeted by migrants that evolved elsewhere. Right? So this kind of large variation between seasons will turn this environment into kind of this hotbed of evolutionary innovation, right? where it you know, is forced to try out different things. And this is even you know, it's a potentially testable prediction. And of course, you can only make these kind of statements in a model where environment is explicit, and this is why we're excited about this model. Okay, so that was my story for evolution. I asked, how does evolution act on performance trade-offs? I told you about this model and some of the reasons why it's very fun, and it turns out that I told you that trade-offs evolve, they depend on history, and that's why, you know, it's a fun, uh, we're excited about this because we can uh, treat this as an interesting null model to compare to data, and maybe it's a silly null model, but at least it is a null model. Okay. So now we saw two stories, and I think you'll agree with me that there wasn't very much connection. <laughs> right? But I promise somehow that I will show you a link. So let's go back to this uh, description of the building block model. So I told you that the way it works is I have these basis vectors, I'm trying to fit my target um, by finding the best expression coefficients to solve this optimization problem. But you might ask, but how does the organism find them? And I could answer, well, I don't really care, I just define this as a phenomenological model to map genomes to fitness in an environment dependent way. I chose to do it like this, that's it. That would actually be a you know, reasonable answer. But real organisms face this kind of problem all the time because you can think of this model as, for example, a caricature of metabolism. Let's say that this target here is the right stoichiometry of all the amino acids, lipids, and everything that I need in this environment uh, to, to survive. Right? And that depends on the environment. And if I can produce and regulate every metabolite independently, then I'm fine. But let's say that you know, my production pathways uh, regulate them in some blocks. How do I regulate my metabolism to hit the right demand? Right? That's a problem that actually real organisms face. So how do they solve it? How do you match production to demand? Let's first think about a one-dimensional example. So I have some metabolite. Uh, or some, you know, some compound X, which I need in some amount. Maybe it's the you know, amino acid I need to produce some proteins, right? So I can produce it, but how do I know how much to produce? How do I make sure that my production meets the demand? Well, there's a very common mechanism uh, used in, uh, very commonly. It's called the endpoint inhibition. So here's what I should do. I should put the production under control of some regulator, and I should make my compound X repress that regulator. So here are the equations 
the dynamics for x is it's used up in some amounts and produced. My production is regulated by this A, and A is repressed by X. So what is the steady state of the system? Uh, if at steady state, X has to be 1, and then P equals to D. Right? And that's a very intuitive mechanism. So I'm, uh, let's say my demand suddenly drops. So I keep producing X that I'm not using. It accumulates, and it represses its own production. Very natural. So to solve this multidimensional problem, I can just use a multidimensional um, generalization of, of, of this mechanism. So this provides a kind of a specific metabolic implementation of this abstract model I told you about. And it's all about the feedback loop between the compounds and the regulators that, that control their production. So I have some number of compounds, and their production, they're produced at some rates P, and this production rate sets their availability in my cytoplasm or something, right, uh, as a function of demand. This is my equation. And I regulate the production with these regulators. And that's a multidimensional uh, generalization. So let's say a regulator uh, controls the production of several compounds. And then every compound represses the regulator it produces. And that's the straightforward generalization of the mechanism I just told you about. So this is the math. And I think you see where I'm going with this. Right? So this evolutionary picture that I told you about, this model, in fact, the story went as follows. We can write fitness like this, but it's kind of missing the functional aspect. I don't know what these uh, SIs actually do. So let me make it more functional. And I make this caricature of metabolism model where regulators, uh, the feedback between regulators and compounds, and this is the mathematics. And of course, that's exactly what happened above where you know, instead of looking at a local Volterra model, I decided to make it more functional describing species by what they do, and this is all the feedback loop between species and resources. So these two stories, uh, you know, they hold on their own. There's lots of fun things uh, uh, to explore. But we can explore, exploit the similarity of this mathematics to maybe begin asking some of the questions that I started with. And now let me loop back to the beginning and show how we think maybe we could make some progress on that. On these big questions of you know, generalizing species and organisms. So the advantage of having the same mathematics in two sides is that you can use concepts that, make, you know, that are very intuitive on one side and translate them into the other and ask what happens. So let's do this from uh, ecology to evolution side. So because my graph now is bipartite, right, it's species and resources, my ecosystem is a matrix, species by ecosystem, there's some entries there. This is the object that describes my ecosystem in this perspective. Well, I could, if I'm looking at such matrices, I can easily imagine, let's take a block diagonal matrix. What does this correspond to? Well, it's very intuitive. I have two non-interacting ecosystems. And of course, I can interpolate between, between the two. I have more and more strongly interacting ecosystems. So what does this become down here? So down here, the same object was my organism is a matrix regulators by compounds. So if it's blood diagonal, well, perhaps that's two organisms. That's actually quite natural, because this is the case where the Optimization problem I told you about factorizes into two independent optimization problems. Right? But what becomes of this middle? Right? What is this here? And I want to stress that the point is not to be able to define a situation where, like, oh, it is 1.7 organisms. Right? That's not what I'm trying to do. Just like in um, like in quantum mechanics, the wave, you know, particle wave duality is not about being able to count particles better. It says that you can only count particles in the regime where they're asymptotically independent, non-interacting. And if it, in any interacting system, the number of particles is just not defined. Right? And that's sort of the hope with something like this. Of course, this is just a cartoon, but we have some ideas of how to make this uh, uh, concrete that we're exploring. So this was about the organism. Can we do something the other way? Can we get inspired by here, move it there, and maybe this could help us something to explore this notion of a species? 
Um, and this is slightly less, we're thinking about that. Uh, one way we're exploring this is actually experimentally uh, with a colleague at, at Yale, Alvaro Sanchez. Uh, we, we do these experiments where we compete communities, like you might with organisms. But you take two communities, you put them in competition, you ask what happens, and this is right, what you would typically do with organisms, and we ask, what is, can we think of a community as a unit in a meaningful sense, which is not an evolutionary sense. Okay, but this is, you know, it, these experiments are very fun, but turn out to be complicated. We do have a preprint on that, but it's, it's kind of in very early stages. But something else we can do to maybe get to this um, notion of a generalizing species is actually to bring in here an idea from somewhere else. It's a very common idea across physics and math, uh, which is do a perturbative expansion around a different origin. You know, it appears in many places. Uh, I will illustrate it with this example that I really like. Let's think about it, some real life solid. It is largely crystal, but it has defects. How would, should I describe the system? Well, if I want to understand the system, one approach is to first understand a perfect crystal and then treat this as a perturbation. But something very interesting you can do, uh, and that's a paper uh, in 2014 by Guderich et al., you can actually do the opposite. You can define this anti-crystal, which is a maximally disordered state, which is um, matter at the brink of the jamming transition, and you can try and do expansion in this direction. And kind of surprisingly, it turns out that some features of this object might be more easily describable from this direction. Kind of fun. So can we do something like this up here with the species? So remember this uh, matrix I showed you of presence or absence of genes and real organisms. So these matrices of, in my context, this would be phenotypes by resources. I now call this phenotypes <laughs> instead of species. <laughs> um, these matrices are not perfectly clustered. But currently, the only way we know how to describe it is this perturbation around this well-clustered case. Right? I know how to think about this, and so maybe I can uh, imagine making, kind of washing the, these clusters a little bit. Right? Do this perturbative expansion from here. But can I do the opposite? Can I start from this regime where, by construction, there's no structure whatsoever, and, in, and instead, add order a little bit, right? Is there a meaningful way in which we could do this perturbation expansion like this? So once again, this is a cartoon, but there is something specific we can do along those lines. Uh, something, uh, I have a paper on that. One thing that's exciting about being at uh, a place like WashU with a medical school, uh, there's a lot of people with actual data. So it turns out that we can actually um, do something of that flavor with real data and possibly a slightly <coughs> less, less of a straw man uh, on this side here. Because of course we don't believe that this is a good approximation, right? But you can make the straw man slightly uh, better and that's the direction we're exploring right now. So to conclude, I told you two stories. One was about just ecology and talking about some phase transition in large and consumer resource models, uh, how we can, it's, uh, this exciting interface between statistical physics and ecology, how we can look for collective phenomena in large N and relate them to uh, generic properties of high dimensionality. I told you an evolutionary story, defining to you a model which um, explaining why it's uh, some of the fun questions we could address with it, uh, and in particular, uh, how we can how it captures some behaviors that we see in the data about trade-offs evolving and depending on evolutionary history and making some non-trivial predictions. But then we observed that, curiously, both sides use the same mathematics and maybe we can exploit this to potentially, you know, maybe there's a path here to do something uh, going beyond discrete notion of species or beyond discrete organisms. So this is how we're trying to approach these questions in my group. But if nothing else, hopefully I at least convince you that microbial ecology has lots of fun questions for theoretical physicists. Uh, and with that, I will 
say thank you and thank my closest collaborators, everybody else, uh, and also put a plug in that WashU is a really fun place to do biophysics. Uh, and thank you for listening. Questions? Yes. It sounds a lot like uh, the idea of the uh, selfish gene, where you have genes that are competing in some species. Do you see that? How do you do that? It's funny you ask. Um, <laughs> one of the actually really fun aspects of this model I described to you for evolution is that we didn't put in any cooperation, altruism, or anything, but There is a uh, kind of emergent competition between the um, expression levels. So it's kind of this user or lose it mechanism. Right? If I have some vector in my basis that I'm not using very much, there's weak pressure, very weak pressure against it acquiring bad mutations, in which case I will never use it again. Right? So by the time something is not used a lot, it will drop off the wagon. And I'll end up with fewer use, usable uh, knobs, which hurts the organism in the sense that now I have lower flexibility in my phenotype. Right? There's a way to make this um, precise and actually map it. It becomes a, in a very, very explicit way an example of a conflict of levels of selection, if you like. But you know, there's no altruism, no cost of cooperation. Right? There's some, some notion of cooperation between genes need to do something together to, to, to fit the target, right? But uh, that's kind of a pretty fun direction, yeah. Any other questions? Yes? So, um, so the models that you were describing um, make some very interesting qualitative predictions that you were, were expressing. Is there a way that you can have, you say, large end models that you get any particular quantitative predictions about the systems that you want to describe? Or is it the case that these, that these equations are sort of too particular to say anything that's too quantitative? So on this side, I don't think this model of ecology literally describes any real ecosystem. And I, um, so there, the point was kind of more a proof of principle of what kind of qualitative behaviors could emerge at large end. On this side, so I you know, alluded to the fact that we're kind of thinking about whether this model could actually apply to data. Um, there, of course, it's also, you know, not literally a description of any real system. However, you can use it. So there's a study, I, I had a reference uh, on one of the slides, where people uh, do these experiments where I have three antibiotics. Well, I don't have anything. Somebody does that. Um, there are three antibiotics, and we, uh, they evolve uh, strains under the pressure from either of the three while monitoring performance in the other three and then at some point you switch which antibiotic you evolve under, right? And you see all this rich behavior for which, you know, if I ask you, so this is kind of nine panels there because, you know, there's all pairs of antibiotics, where I evolve and where I evaluate. If I give you eight of those panels and ask you to predict something about the ninth, right? How do you do that? Right now we can't do that. That's what I mean by the null model. And this null model will probably be wrong in some cases, right? And that's precisely the exciting cases, right? The role of theory at some point is to be wrong, to highlight what are the interesting observations, right? That's what we're trying uh, to do with this. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Atish. So, so you described like you know, one way of thinking about kind of going between like having species and not having species is this kind of like, you know, expanding around different points of, say, this way in the time matrix or something. Another way one could think about it is, say, via a combination via, like, gene flow. Like, you'd say, okay, you know, maybe there's, these two types are able to exchange genetic information very freely, um, but these two types can exchange it somewhat, but not much. Um, have you thought about that at all, either kind of by explicitly modeling it or it emerging out, like, out of um, some of these models? I think this is a really interesting question. Um, let me go back, show one of the slides early on in the introduction. So, uh, I'm really interested in this work uh, by Eric von Nimwagen where um, actually Edico Cell Groups also has uh, this result that the dominant form in which SNPs appear in a population of related bacteria is actually not de novo mutations, but uh, through recombination. Which means that 
whatever maintains the cohesion of these groups of what we call species, uh, because experimentally, you know, E. coli is more different from Colobacter than from other E. coli, is somehow actually based on the recombination being preferentially with those that are similar to you. I don't have, I don't know very much about this field, so I'm trying actually to set up a collaboration with Eric to try and learn from them because they've been in this industry for a while. There, it's, um, I think it's a very interesting field that I would love to get into. <laughs> um, yes. Yes. I understand that gene transfer uh, occurs with viruses and things like that. Or is there more that you would put into the model to encompass such things? <laughs> Yeah, so indeed, when this horizontal gene transfer, there are multiple mechanisms of that, and one of them is that uh, kind of uh, through viral infections, it's the infection by the virus that ends up uh, transferring a, a piece of DNA. Um, great question. Uh, some, some argue that kind of it's the, in many studies, people ignore viruses because they're harder to, you know, get sequencing information about, and so we kind of assume that, well, viruses we'll get to them eventually. Some people argue that that is an exceptionally important evolutionary force for maintaining diversity, right? So, excellent question. I didn't think very much about that. All right. Well, there are no other questions. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.